herzlich willkommen. Ich bin nicht Urs Spöri, äh, obwohl ich den Akzent äh, liefern könnte, der zu seinem Namen passen würde. Äh, Urs Spöri ist heute ausnahmsweise mal nicht hier und ich übernehme dann auch die Begrüßung im Namen des Filmmuseums und erlaube mir zunächst Sie darauf hinzuweisen, dass im Rahmenprogramm äh, im Juni eine Reihe von Filmen gezeigt werden, die mit diesem Film in einem direkten Zusammenhang stehen, also mit Lions Love, der in Los Angeles gedreht wurde, und äh, die zu sehen sich unbedingt auch lohnt, nämlich ähm, äh, Model Shop von Jacques Demy, der am Samstag um 18 Uhr gezeigt wird. Das ist sowas wie das Gegenstück Demis zu Lions Love zur gleichen Zeit in Los Angeles entstanden und dann, äh, wie ich finde, eine sehr inspirierte Programmierung des Filmmuseums, Killer of Sheep von Charles Burnett, ein Film aus den 70er Jahren und einer der äh, Initialfilme des New Black Cinema, der am 25. und äh, 29. Ähm, Juni gezeigt wird und darauf sei eigentlich hingewiesen in einer frischen 35mm Kopie. Ähm, heute Abend gibt es nach dem Vortrag eine 10-minütige Pause, in der das Filmcafé geöffnet hat, äh, wie üblich äh, der Abschluss und dann wollte ich noch darauf hinweisen, dass dies der zweitletzte Anlass ist im Rahmen unserer äh, Reihe zu Agnès Varda und äh, dass der letzte Vortrag und der letzte Filmabend in dieser Reihe stattfinden wird am 7. Juli ähm, und da wird unser Gast äh, Jonathan Rosenbaum sein aus Chicago, der sprechen wir zu äh, saint ouen Vogelfrei heißt der Film, glaube ich, auf Deutsch. Ähm, einem der wichtigen Filme von, von Agnès Varda aus den 80er Jahren. Ich erlaube mir auch schon die Ankündigung, dass die Reihe Lecture und Film im Wintersemester bzw. im akademischen Jahr 2016-17 eine äh, Fortsetzung finden wird. Ähm, wir werden uns äh, über zehn Monate hinweg für einmal mit Hollywood auseinandersetzen und zugleich mit dem deutschen Kino was dem Haus hier ein besonderes Anliegen ist. Wir werden über Ernst Lubitsch uns unterhalten unter dem Arbeitstitel Krise, Kritik, Komödie. Now I'm switching to English to welcome and introduce tonight's guest. Um, in this series, we've learned a lot about what you might call the site-specific character of Agnes Valda's work. There are certain places, locations, that play an important role in her work, um, like Set, the town in the south of France where she passed part of her childhood, and which was the location for her first uh, feature film, La Pointe Courte, which uh, um, we discussed last week, uh, the Rue Daguerre in Paris, where she's been living for 50 years now and where her production company is located and to which she has uh, dedicated an entire film. Uh, Noirmoutier, an island off the coast uh, uh, of Nantes, um, where uh, she and Jacques Demy own the house and which uh, figures in a number of her works. And you might add to that list California and Los Angeles as one of the Uh, places or locations that uh, are of particular importance to Agnès Valda and uh, are of particular importance in her work. Uh, this is, you know, the only location outside of France where she has um, uh, worked with any degree of consistency. She moved to L.A. together with Jacques Demy in the 1960s when uh, Hollywood became interested in working actually with both of them. Uh, none of the projects materialized that the studios wanted to um, negotiate with the two directors. Uh, I think Mark is going to be talking about this tonight too. And it's part of the film. We see uh, several scenes uh, where uh, the difficulties of negotiating with the Hollywood studios for filmmakers like Valda and Demi are explicitly um, thematized. Um, we've also learned a lot about how... Um, variegated the work of 
Varda is and how she excels in a variety of artistic disciplines and is actually not someone who can pin down, be pinned down to just one genre or actually even just one medium. She's a photographer, she's a filmmaker, she's an installation artist, she works in fiction films, she uh, uh, creates documentaries, uh, she does installation work, poetic films. So it's a wide variety of topics and genres that um, uh, she, uh, that, that uh, her work is comprised of. Now, our principle in the series is to fly in uh, noted specialists on the topics that we want to discuss from all over the world. And uh, the idea behind this is, of course, that we always want to have the people who are best qualified to talk about the topic at hand. And we want to stay true to that principle, even in a case like tonight's, where uh, it only took me like a 20 meter walk down the hallway at Goethe Universität and a knock on the second door to the left to get in touch with our uh, specialist for tonight. Our speaker tonight is Mark Siegel, and uh, one of the things that he has in common with Agnes Valda, if I may so put it, is uh, that he excels in a variety of fields and disciplines. He's a, um, a film scholar, he's one of the uh, most important scholars working today on American underground film, uh, in particular the work of Jack Smith. Uh, he's a curator, uh, he's a film curator, he's a theater man, um, he has many talents, but he, I think, is going to focus on the film scholar part here uh, tonight. And he is also particularly qualified to be talking about this film because He's also one of the world specialists on Andy Warhol's films. And the star of tonight's film, of course, is uh, Viva, who uh, Agnes Valda basically lifted from Warhol's uh, films from the 1960s. And as the quote already shows you, turned into something that uh, showed an even a new side even to Andy Warhol. But uh, the, the other reason why Mark Siegel is the perfect speaker for tonight is that he knows Los Angeles really well. Uh, having lived there, having gone through graduate school in Los Angeles, and uh, having developed a, uh, I think, profound relationship with the city, which uniquely qualifies him to introduce us to tonight's film. Please welcome together with me, Mark Siegel. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for coming to the series, Self-Portraits of Others the films of Agnes Varda. What do we mean when we describe the films of Agnes Varda as self-portraits of others? What does such a description tell us about Varda's cinematic style and about the relationship between her camera and those before it? Now that many of us have had the great opportunity to watch so many Varda films, to hear numerous lectures about them and to engage in sometimes heated post-screening discussions about her work and the scholarship about it, we might better understand Vincent Heidegger, who in the opening lecture of this series argued convincingly to my mind that making self-portraits of others could be understood as a generative principle of Varda's work. Just to refresh our memory, Vincent's took this phrase, the title of our series, from an exchange in Varda's 1988 film, Jane B. by Agnes V. A scene in which Varda pushes Birkin to overcome her discomfort at looking at the camera. Think of it as a mirror, Varda suggests. But in the mirror, you're alone. It's as if I'm filming your self-portrait. You won't be alone in this mirror, there is the camera, which is a little bit me. I'll be visible too, every now and then, in the camera and in the background. Birkin doesn't have any problems looking Agnes in the eyes, but looking into the camera, she says, feels like a trap. At this point, Varda ends the discussion by saying something to the effect of, you have to follow the rules of the game and look into the camera as often as possible. If you don't look into the camera, you won't be looking at me. As if refusing Birkin the possibility of looking elsewhere to see Varda doesn't already confirm the star's suspicion that the camera is a trap. Setting aside this deception, 
how can a face-to-face -face relationship between the filmmaker and the star mediate their relationship with others, mediate Birkin's fear of the others? Does the transformation of the camera into a mirror or into a two-way mirror, one that shows both Birkin and Varda, necessarily alter the power dynamics between them? As Vincent's argued, looking directly into the camera breaks with the rules of the game in conventional narrative cinema. But this act is constitutive of the rules of Varda's cinematic game. Equally part of Varda's game is her own entrance into the image. The self-portraits of others that she makes are thus, to some extent, portraits of herself. But to what extent? What do we learn about Varda through her presence every now and then in the background of the image? Moreover, what are the ethics of appropriating, appropriating for the self the task of making someone else's self-portrait, however faked it may be? Making self-portraits of others may be a generative principle of Varda's cinematic poetics, but does it constitute an ethics? My desire to reflect on the ethics of Varda's portrayal of others stems not only from our discussions about her films in this series. I do so also as a means of situating my talk tonight in the context of the project week that is currently taking place in the Department of Theater, Film and Media Studies, my department, at the Goethe University. This interdisciplinary project, organized and led by students and faculty, considers perspectives on the impossibilities and possibilities of representations of refugees from a variety of historical, political, theoretical, and aesthetic perspectives. Although Varda's work, including her 1969 film Lion's Love, does not deal with refugees directly or specifically, actually, at all, it does focus um, her work does focus often on people marginalized by social and political conventions, by gender and sexual norms, by economic injustice. A critical look at the formal and aesthetic strategies she uses to depict these others can only further our understanding of the dynamics between self and other that are at the heart of representations of refugees in Germany and elsewhere. Another key term that might stand alongside self-portraits of others as a generative principle of Varda's poetics is that of subjective documentary. Throughout her work, whether filming the passers-by on the Rue Mouftar or the inhabitants of the Rue Daguerre, Varda makes clear that what she is offering up for consideration is not an objective look at reality. She is definitely interested in complicating distinctions between objective, subjective, true, false, representation, reality. Think of the clever title of her 1981 film, Documenteur, that announces the documentary filmmaker as a liar, a monteur. Varda's subjective vision positions and lends form to many of her films. This is perhaps most explicit in L'Opera Mouffe, which in the opening credits is announced as the cinematic notebook of a pregnant woman. The shots of a nude pregnant woman, presumably Varda herself, follow the director's title card and provide thereby a link between the subjectivity of the woman behind the camera and the visible world in front of it. The film is peppered with intertitles that lend structure to the sequences of documentary images of life on the bustling market street. These intertitles either explicitly invoke pregnancy and the desires of a pregnant woman, cravings is one of them, or provide categories for grouping images of the anonymous faces and fates of the passers-by. Someone, the missing. L'Opera Mouffe is thus not just a documentary about life on the Rue Mouffetard, but a subjective documentary or personal essay film, if you will, conceived by a pregnant female director and structured according to her interests and desires. 
Varda inscribes her presence in the images of L'Opera Mouf so as to make explicit one aspect of her relationship to them. She is pregnant and is therefore attracted to particular things on the Rue Mouftar. Plentiful amounts of glistening fish, pregnant belly-shaped squashes, fetus-like images of a bird in a glass ball, and a seemingly destitute pregnant woman on the street here eating flowers, cravings. This somewhat subtle self-reflexivity is nevertheless an important step towards diffusing documentary assertions of neutrality and objectivity. Moreover, it makes explicit that these cinematic images of others and things are produced at the intersection of social relationships. It may also be a gesture of honesty in that it refers the sounds and images back to the person who conceived them, partially justifying their unusual selection and organization. If we therefore argue that this reference to the self is not just incidental to the images that follow, but crucial to them, crucial because it circumscribes their meaning, does then this honest self-reflexivity allow not only a reflection on the limits of the social, but on the limits of the self as well? Is Varda's inscription of herself in her films a mode of the kind of critical self-reflexivity espoused by filmmaker and theorist Trinti Minha, who refers to processes of preventing meaning from ending with what is said and what is shown. If meaning is allowed to develop and shift within and beyond the framing of cinematic representation, then it incorporates questions about production relations into its movement. For Trin, self-reflexivity is not simply about subjectivizing images, as in justifying them, but is rather about situating the self in a reflexive relationship with the other, the represented other and the other of representation. This is a self in process, a self constructed in and through its relationship to the other. And, or not to end, as she puts it, and I quote, a subject who points to him, her, itself as subject in process, a work that displays its formal properties or its own constitution as work, is bound to upset one's sense of identity. The familiar distinction between the same and the other, because the latter is no longer kept in a recognizable relation of dependence, derivation, or appropriation. We may argue that a pregnant woman is an excellent example of a subject in process. But whether or not this subjectivization frees Varda's images from recognizable relations of dependence, derivation, or appropriation, I will leave to those of you who have seen the film, which we screened twice in this series and which is available to watch on YouTube. Before moving on to discuss the film we will watch together tonight, Allow me to address one more case of Varda's insertion of herself into one of her films. I do so because I think it presents a prime example of the critical self-reflexivity espoused by Trin, and as such can serve as a prime example, oh, that's the same sentence, and as such can serve as a reference point for considering the relationship between self and other in Lion's Love. Varda's subjective documentary, Les Glaneurs et les Glaneurs, The Gleaners and I, made in the year 2000, is a fascinating road movie that portrays people who reclaim and recycle for their personal use, not only discarded and unused food, but also objects, art, and in the case of Varda herself, images. Throughout the film, Varda makes her presence known 
through first-person voiceover narration, her entrance into the image as interviewer, and numerous references to her daily life, problems with her apartment, reflections on her childhood and her travels, etc. The shaky images she produces with her handheld digital camera are, of course, a further inscription of the self into the image. In this film, more radically than in L'Opera Mouffe, Varda's self-reflexivity is meant to articulate a relationship between herself and the others in front of the camera, between herself and the predominantly economically and socially marginalized gleaners. She describes herself as a gleaner of images. And as my colleague Sonia Campanini argued in her illuminating presentation in this series a few weeks ago, Varda does reuse images typically discarded by other filmmakers. The dance of the lens cap was Sonia's example. Images of the lens cap from Varda's camera bouncing about that she inadvertently shot, but decided nevertheless to glean for her film. To my mind, a number of Varda's references to the self, however honest they may be, about her need to repair her apartment, her display of knickknacks she collected on her trip to Japan, for instance, verge on the narcissistic, the self-indulgent, rather than the self-critical, and only serve to solidify the distinctions between self and other that she elsewhere in the film so adroitly calls into question. As I see it, her self reflexivity only becomes a critical reflection on the limits of the self and the social when she ruminates on her mortality and on the otherness within the self. Confronting her aging body, Varda exposes the time constraints on her experience of the social. She also makes explicit the fact of othering entailed in the portrayal of the self. All self-portraits are portraits of an other. This, of course, is not to say that all others are positioned equally in relation to social, economic, and political forces or gender and racial norms. What makes Varda's reflections on her aging, othered body so moving, both so moving and, as I see it, so ethically relevant, is that they don't facilitate the hasty assimilation of the otherness of the gleaners to the otherness of the self. Varda's aging body marks herself as a self in process, but doesn't exemplify her role as a gleaner. It doesn't make her like them. If anything, it exposes her difference from them, her impending expiration date, her potential status as gleaned, not gleaner. <laughs> By analyzing the ethics of Varda's cinematic poetics, I'm not attempting to call into question the sincerity of Varda's interest in the many others who have come before her camera. And I hope I'm not just being the nurgler that was so labeled by a beloved colleague. Varda is obviously and genuinely drawn toward people existing on the margins of society. What I am questioning, however, are the cinematic methods by which she marks her relationship to these others. Or, to speak again with Trinti Minha, I want to understand better if and how Varda's self-reflexivity is part of, quote, an analysis of established forms of the social that define one's limits. With these thoughts in mind, let's turn to the first feature length film Varda made in Los Angeles, a film with a strange title, Lion's Love, a title that brings together two of Varda's concerns, felines and love stories. In case you haven't figured out already, I'm allergic to cats. The original title was Lion's Love and Lies, adding another of Varda's interests, which in this case, um, the lies, she intended to refer to the media. But the cast thought that the title was too long and too explicit. 
so Varda agreed to shorten it to the two words written on the clapboard. Lion's Love is Varda's fifth feature film, after La Pointe Courte, Cléo from Five to Seven, Le Bonheur, and Les Créatures. Let's let Varda herself tell us what the film is about. Here she is in a clip from a 1969 television broadcast shot when she was in New York promoting the film at the New York Film Festival. Jack Kroll, lead film critic from Newsweek magazine, interviews and mansplains her while Susan Sontag smokes and looks on bemused. Varda begins by criticizing Kroll and the television announcer's pejorative description of her lead characters as grotesque. Kann ich jetzt den ersten Clip haben? Carlos Clarence, Cuban-born film critic, who appears in Lion's Love in a delightful supporting role, claims that it was at the Venice Film Festival in 1967 where Varda presented her quirky nouveau roman inspired narrative film Les Créatures that the director came to the realization that fictional film had been surpassed and replaced by film témoignage, a documentary or testimonial documentary film style. Indeed, Varda quickly became involved in the omnibus documentary protest film Far From Vietnam with Chris Marker, Jean-Luc Godard, Horace Ivins, and others. And then, um, actually her section, she was ended up kind of booted out of the film, but nevertheless, she was involved in it and conceiving it. Um, and then she made Lion's Love, which we should therefore consider a key transitional work in her oeuvre. Beginning with Lion's Love, she would never again return to the kind of hermetic fictional world of the earlier features, except arguably for Vagabond, which we can discuss in, uh, on July 7th. In the television interview, we heard Varda describe the film not so much as a story, but as a chronicle. It is a chronicle of 10 days in June 1968, from the 1st to the 9th, the period during which Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles, immediately after winning the Democratic primary in California, and when Andy Warhol was shot and almost killed in New York by actress and radical feminist Valerie Solanas. In other interviews, Varda speaks of the film as a collage and as an inventory of elements of American culture, and yes, as a subjective documentary. But what is subjective about this chronicle of Viva, Jerome Ragney, and Jerry Ratto in their normal, everyday kind of life? How is Varda's subjectivity inscribed into the film? In his report on the film for Calle du Cinema in 1969, Carlos Clarence notes further, we're supposed to play ourselves, or rather the idea that Agnes has of ourselves. To grasp the idea that Varda had of Carlos and the assorted countercultural figures she assembled for the film in 1969, it will unfortunately be necessary to talk about hippies. <laughs> but we will at least get to discuss Viva and Warhol's films a bit as well. I call the second part of my talk Inventory of a Rented Counterculture. One, Arrival of the French. In 1967, Varda's husband Jacques Demy was invited to Los Angeles by Columbia Pictures to make a film, Model Shop, released in 1969. While Demy had long dreamed of making pictures in Hollywood, Varda had little interest, either in the mythical studio system or in the imperialist warmongering USA, or I should say in the English language. She actually claims that she learned to speak English by watching the subtitles to Lion's Love. Um, so perhaps tonight you will learn to speak French. <laughs> Keep in mind that this was also the time she became involved in the Far From Vietnam documentary project. But with de Gaulle as president of France taking a strong stance against the US-led war in Vietnam, many French leftists who didn't want to align themselves with him took a different line of critique and slowly began acknowledging the radical, even revolutionary potential of the American countercultural black and youth movements. 
French intellectuals like Edgar Morin and Jean-Francois Revel made the trip to the United States, and upon experiencing firsthand the tensions and oppositional movements within U.S. American society, they became interested. They realized that the revolt against the American way of life was American too. Morin wrote in his Journal de Californie in 1970, the most barbarous of civilized countries, but also the most civilized of barbarous countries, all countries being barbarous. If he was previously ambivalent about the United States, Morin now, or despite his love of the star system, I should say, but um, previously ambivalent, Morin now proclaimed euphorically, quote, I love America, quote. In the spirit of this leftist embrace of American culture, French leftist embrace of American culture, when Demi called Varda and asked her to join him, she commented, or I'm sorry, she consented like a nice little wife, as she playfully recalls, but under the condition that she could return if she didn't like it. She liked it. Demi and Varda were honored at the San Francisco International Film Festival in the fall of 1967, where Varda presented Les Créatures. There, she met a group of students who worked with her on her first American film, Uncle Yanko, a 22-minute portrait of her distant cousin, an artist who lived a bohemian life on a boat in Sausalito, just across the bay from San Francisco. Yanko was an inspiration for a group of young hippies who came to his weekly open house hangout sessions. As a result of this collaboration with the young countercultural figures and leftist Berkeley students on her short film, Varda found her way not only to the Black Panthers, about whom she soon made her second American short film early the following year, but also to the hippies. In her 1970 article for the French journal Cinéma, titled The Americanization of Agnès, or I should say of Agnes, Journalist Claire Clouseau clarifies that Varda's young cl collaborators didn't approve of the aesthetics and ethics of the one film of hers that they had seen, Le Bonheur, but they accepted her as a person and initiated her into the hippie lifestyle. Back in Los Angeles, Varda, now seemingly Edgar Moranian in her enthusiasm for California, agreed to make a film with Columbia Pictures as well. Peace and Love was the name of her narrative film about a young female star of television commercials who, in a fit of anarchic rebelliousness, quits her successful career and falls in love with a French lawyer. Sharon Tate, who was brutally murdered by Charles Manson and his hippie family in August 1969, was being considered for the starring role. After long negotiations, Peace and Love fell through in early 1969 because Varda refused to give up the right of final cut. Varda claims that the studio had previously given Antonioni, another European suddenly taken with the American counterculture, final cut on Zabriskie Point, and they were not happy with the results. She was offered and quickly turned down other projects, including a film with Anne Margaret, dreadful story, she said, and a frightful television series with Lana Turner and George Harrison. That would have been fantastic. Um, in a twist of fate that might perhaps only be possible in Tinseltown, and I know that to be a fact because I'm from there. Varda found herself in a Hollywood restaurant recounting her frustrations about Columbia Pictures to the owner of a clothing company from Philadelphia who quickly took interest and decided to offer her the money to make a film. This man, Max Rab, owned the influential women's clothing company, The Villager, with its junior division Ladybug, both of which were known for fostering the preppy conservative look among 1960s women and young ladies with their solid color button-down shirts and blouses. Interested in cinema, Rab went on to produce another not exactly preppy film like A Clockwork Orange, and also Nicholas Rogue's Walkabout. With the money from Rob, 
Varda set about conceiving a project that could address her newfound enthusiasm for a whole bunch of things she experienced over the previous 18 months, including Hollywood, its star culture, the counterculture and its appropriation of Hollywood myths, Warhol's 1967 commercially motivated films, film témoignage, and beat poet Michael McClure's play, The Beard, the poster of which likely inspired her original three-part title with its proclamation of Love, Lion, Lioness. McClure's play is a rambunctious verbal joust between two characters, the mythological Old West gunfighter, Billy the Kid, and the mythological pre-code Hollywood star, Jean Harlow. Appropriating these icons for the burgeoning countercultural scenes, McClure's 1965 play would seem to anticipate such later appropriations of American mythology, such as Arthur Penn's 1964 film, 67 film Bonnie and Clyde, and Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda's 1969 Easy Rider. Viewing American history, politics, and culture through the media, and through the mediated lens of the counterculture, characterized Varda's experience of Los Angeles, and therefore drives the story, whatever story there is, of Lion's Love, which was shot in March 1969. So it's actually quite amazing, just like two months after she was rejected, um, she put together this film very quickly. In an early interview about the film, she makes it clear that the story is actually about her. It's a collage of what happened to me in Hollywood in 1968. I was in Hollywood when McClure's play opened. I was there when Kennedy's assassination happened. I watched it all on TV. There I met Viva. Actually, I think she met Viva in New York. But okay, she says, there I met Viva and the only movies I saw in Hollywood that I liked were Andy's movies. Perhaps Lion's Love is the Californian scene with a French touch, as a New York flyer for the film proclaimed. When Varda arrived in Los Angeles in 1967, the underground was already dead. By most accounts, Warhol's mammoth three and a half hour, 16 millimeter double screen epic, The Chelsea Girls from 1966, the first underground film to play in a cinema with carpets, as regretted by the New York Times film critic, sealed the lid on the coffin of that sexually transgressive, playfully subversive and Hollywood star obsessed period in the 1960s American avant-garde that we know of as underground film. The film's financial success and wide mainstream attention, the rise of a new dominant strand in the avant-garde, structural film, and the increasing politicization of the counterculture are typically cited as reasons for the dissolution of the energy of this previously vital underground movement. In 1967, Warhol devoted himself almost, almost exclusively to what he and his significant, significant collaborator in this period, Paul Morrissey, considered to be commercially viable feature-length films. All Warhol's 1967 films, and there are seven of them, I believe, more or less. Um, all of Warhol's 1967 films were edited, featured post-production work, novelties in Warhol cinema, and tended to incorporate an ample amount of teasing homo and heteroerotic images into a narrative about an outsider to the Bohemian factory scene who interacts with successive insiders. These were the underground films. Oh, did I get ahead of myself? Oh, I did. Oh, did you read that? Okay. <laughs> okay, you saw that? Okay. Oh, no, whoops. <laughs> These were the underground films that Varda and Emi cared for. Warhol's Bike Boy, I, a Man, a Nude Restaurant, each of which screened in Los Angeles in 1968. And I could talk maybe in the discussion if you're interested about the underground films that they did not care for, um, which were pretty much all of them <laughs> up until this point. 
Despite the at times disturbing class antagonism and misogyny that surface in some of the exchanges between the outsiders, the working class motorcycle enthusiast Joe Spencer in Bike Boy, for instance, and the Warhol insiders. So despite this, the films retain a striking Warholian commitment to presenting and respecting a range of subcultural types in their singularity and difference. In his analysis of Warhol's 1963 silent film, Blowjob, Douglas Crimp reads the shadows in the image caused by the overhead lighting that cover the young man's face while he is presumably being pleasured off screen as an aesthetic choice with ethical implications. These shadows preserve a space of difference for the man. When he looks in the camera, he sees us but we, and presumably Warhol behind the camera, can't see into his eyes. We can only take hold of him when he looks away. An ethics of anti-voyeuristic looking, Crimp provocatively claims. Is this an ethical way of making a self-portrait of others? The 1967 films, of course, also presented audiences with Viva, the chatterbox Raphaelesque beauty who, as Warhol noted, introduced women's issues into the factory. Viva's proto-feminism must have certainly been of interest to Varda, who noted the, the significance of encountering the women's movement during her first stay in the United States. And she specifically refers to women's studies programs, um, which of course they didn't have in France and were just getting started at the time when she arrived. For new enthusiasts of the underground, like Demi and Varda, so let's say newcomers to the underground, Viva might even have been taken as a stand-in for Warhol and the entirety of the factory scene due to her performance as an underground filmmaker, obviously patterned after Warhol, alongside Paul Morrissey and other factory denizens in John Schlesinger's 1969 film Midnight Cowboy. So I don't have an image of that. But, and this point is important to me, the Warhol scene was not a hippie scene. As Warhol superstar Mary Warnov pointedly puts it, we spoke two completely different languages. We were on amphetamine and they were on acid. They were so slow to speak with these wide open eyes, oh wow, so into their vibrations. We spoke in rapid machine gun fire about books and paintings and movies. They were into free and the American Indian and going back to the land and trying to be some kind of true authentic person. We could not have cared less about that. They were homophobic, we were homosexual. Their women were, they were just, or they were these big round titted girls. You would say hello to them and they would just flop down on the bed and fuck you. We liked sexual tension. S&M, not fucking. They were barefoot, we had platform boots. They were eating bread they had baked themselves and we never ate at all. <laughs> um, in Nude Restaurant, Viva reacts to a hippie in her midst and um, I will show now two short clips. And in the first clip, um, these are clips from, yeah, from Nude Restaurant. Um, Warhol was working with an editing technique um, um, called the, the strobe cut, where he would turn on and off the camera. And so that produces um, a loud buzz. So we hear right at the beginning of the first clip, a loud buzz, it will go away, don't freak out. Um, kann ich jetzt um, die zweite, der zweite und dritte Clip haben, bitte? In her hilarious and indispensable Romana Clay, the 1970 book Superstar, Viva describes the grueling work on the film that she calls Tiger's Tremble, directed by Adele Vargas. <laughs> Bemoaning the fact that Vargas didn't follow her advice and hire Lenny Walter, referring to the Warhol star Louis Walden, a frequent co-star with Viva, to appear with her, Viva, uh, to appear with her, Viva refers to Ragni and Rado as groovy and hippie, co-authors of Mustache, 
a drug-oriented Broadway play. Quote, the name of the film was Tiger's Tremble. To look more like a tiger, Adele wanted me to bleach my hair and cut it off on top. Then it would match the hair of Groovy and Hippie, supposedly. What I'd like to suggest is that the counterculture Varda inventories in Lion's Love is both rented and imported, mainly from New York. Viva was actually living in, New in Europe when Varda telegrammed her and offered her the job. Neither Groovy, oh, whoops. Oh, oh, no, that was intended. Okay. Neither, I think so. Oh, yeah, there. Sorry. Neither Groovy nor Hippie were local to the Los Angeles scene. In fact, through their massive success with their Broadway, initially off Broadway, tribal love musical hair in 1968, the two of them played a key role in the commercialization of the Hippie scene. And they capitalized tremendously on the anti consumerist agenda of the counterculture going on to sell the rights of the musical to Hollywood. Varda was initially asked to direct the film, but the job eventually went to another European, Miłosz Forman, who shot it in 1979. Cinema Verité filmmaker Shirley Clark, who plays a stand-in for Varda in Lion's Love, was also a mainstay of the sophisticated New York scene, lived in the Chelsea Hotel, where Viva would stay when she returned to Manhattan after the Varda film. To my mind, the few scenes between Viva and Shirley Clark in the film are the ones with the most dynamism, largely because of their shared sensibilities. There are also cameos by Eddie Constantine and film director Peter Bogdanovich, who inadvertently showed up at the Larry Edmonds Cinema Bookshop while Varda was filming. In importing a variety of figures from elsewhere and forcing them together in a secluded rented house in the Hollywood Hills, where most of the film takes place. Varda not only almost entirely excludes the actual countercultural scenes in Los Angeles, but also erases significant differences among various scenes. There are shots of subcultural stuff in LA. I'm kind of pushing this argument a bit. I fear that with Lion's Love, she homogenizes the at times antagonistic strands of the counterculture into one long haired feline scene. For me, at least, her inventory just doesn't add up. Take further note, for instance, of the rock star images on the walls, Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix. Okay, they were hippie icons and Morrison, an LA native, of course, perhaps the only one in the film. But Zappa, whose LA band, the Mothers of Invention, positioned itself aggressively against the hippie aesthetic of the natural and the true. Three and my conclusion, hippies and death. If Warhol and the underground film movement were already dead at the time of Lion's Love, and Warhol was almost literally dead, then so was the hippie movement. Emerging out of the beatnik scene of the late 40s and 50s and culminating in the summer of love in 1967, the hippie scene quickly disintegrated into a disgruntled ragtag of burnouts and drug-damaged outsiders. New York artist Paul Tech's 1967 installation, Death of a Hippie, already seemed to announce the end of hippie utopianism a message that would resonate more clearly after the Manson family murders and the violence at the Altamont Festival, rock music festival, in the late summer and winter of 1969. At one point in the film, while watching hours of television footage covering the assassination of Robert Kennedy, and at the same time receiving a phone call informing her that Warhol has been shot, and also at the same time discovering that Shirley Clark has taken an apparent overdose in the bed next to her, Viva says, with her characteristically blasé expression, I can't stand it. Shirley, Kennedy, Andy, everybody's dying. Perhaps the deaths of the countercultures inscribe themselves too in this melancholic and listless film. And it is these deaths, I believe, that trump Varda's enthusiasm and cast a shadow over the gorgeous Los Angeles light-strewn images in the rented house. Death, again, as a limit to the experience of the social. But in this case, as opposed to the example of the Gleaners and I, these deaths, to my mind, don't succeed in questioning the limits of the self as well. Never mind. After all, the film did, 
um, Rise Again, providing a cover image for Andy Warhol's new magazine venture interview in 1969, and thus marking a moment of the artist's transition from his 60s film avant-garde work to the commercial enterprises of the 1970s. The business of art to the art of business, as he put it. And Varda indeed reclaimed, let's say gleaned the film for her own business of art. When she turned the original 35 millimeter celluloid strips of Lion's Love into one of her shacks of failure, a shack of cinema constructed out of the celluloid footage from her old failed film products. Thank you. And I believe there will be a brief, about a 10 minute um, uh, intermission before we start the film, which I highly recommend despite my pessimistic um, <laughs> ending note. Um, and uh, the film cafe is open and there will also be gongs that will ring um, to call you back into the cinema. Thanks again. Yeah, there's someone. Yeah, he's going to do it. So uh, we have time for a <laughs> short discussion for those who want to stay and uh, and talk about the film with Mark Siegel. Uh, let me first thank you for that for that wonderful presentation. Um, I think it deserves an applause again. <laughs> um, Last week we saw La Pointe Courte, and uh, one of the things I said about the film and Richard Neupert's presentation was that uh, seeing it again, I, uh, only seeing it again, I realized how much of a film about cats that was. <laughs> and with this film, seeing it again made me realize how much a film about coffee this <laughs> is. Uh, maybe you want to say something about coffee later on. But uh, <laughs> let me open with 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 a with a different um, approach or a different question. Um, in a way, what you're saying is she gets it all wrong because these people would never hang out together, um, and her sort of version of underground culture is a composite fan construct from someone who viewed certain aspects of it from afar and then mingles it all together and creates something that somehow doesn't quite work because of all the nuances that, you know, are lighted by the kind of constellation that she creates. I mean, you mm -hmm. forcefully mm -hmm. quoted the forceful <laughs> Mary Warrenoff, who mm -hmm. reminded of, uh, us of just how much of a gulf separated the hippies from the Warhol scene mm -hmm. uh, and the East Coast from the West Coast, too. Yeah. yeah. So um, maybe you could elaborate on that. Mm. And um, I, would, uh, I was also going to say, you know, you, of course, didn't grow up in Europe. Uh, uh huh. <laughs> and <laughs> and there, a, a point could be made for Borho, uh, for Agnes Valda's sort of naive perspective on American popular culture and underground culture of the 1960s, where she just has yeah, sort of a an eclectic approach to it. Uh, I guess I, I have no trouble with naivete. Okay, um, and. In relation to the coffee, I wish there was more coffee energy in the film. Um, but I think I think I was just trying to figure out, honestly, like why, like for me, frankly, the film doesn't work. Um, and there, and I was just trying to figure out for myself why that is, because it has so many elements in it that I personally like and that interest me. And and then um, I felt that that not that. It's not, and then I came to think, well, to me, it seems, I mean, I just have, maybe it's a subjective thing. I just hate those two guys. Um, but, but I think that also we see, even in the final moments, um, how Viva can hold our attention. Um, 
and how they are just not able to in my mind that they cannot deal with um cinema with a camera with the the pressures there and that they and okay and so so i just felt that that then for me the problem really was with varda not that she not that she not that she can't have her image of the of the scenes and and uh, her kind of outside perspective but i think somehow she is not there i say not honest um with her relationship to those scenes mm -hmm. that that the the perhaps for me the most powerful moment in the film which i didn't discuss in my talk i didn't want to um is the moment with shirley clark um where shirley clark really does really doesn't um why not yeah she does not want just can't perform the kind of stupid script that the varda is asking her to do to my mind and to shirley's mind of like now you have to perform that you're going to do a suicide and then that varda steps in for me that's a moment of where i thought okay as i was watching it, i thought oh no like um that's the moment that that's i guess that's a moment i wish the whole film were somewhat in that vein mm. that's the moment where it seemed to me that it works where varda's um investments for good or bad come through um whereas in in the other throughout the rest of the film it, it just for me um yeah it just doesn't work and so so i was trying to figure out why and then i kind of to my mind located in um in just a kind of mishmash of references of um of performance styles um strategies that that that, that don't come together mm. um that that's from viewing the film from researching the film i mean varda i didn't mention this either but varda um actually improvised with the actors um and then from their improvisation she took um what she felt to be the best moments and wrote a kind of scenario that then she gave to them um very shortly i think just a day beforehand and then would kind of coach them you want to get basically from here to there um that could work um to my mind I, i'm sorry to be like mr negative um there's fantastic and fabulous things in it but i'm just trying to clarify that but to my mind um we see in the performances uh, um a kind of lackluster attempt to to repeat something which i which we don't get in um for instance in the in the clip i showed the very brief clips i showed with viva where we see an incredible kind of liveliness and dynamism mm -hmm here i don't feel that she has the the partners in the yeah. same with the same sensibility mm -hmm. to 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 achieve that she herself is still fantastic but but that that's um yeah a kind of long way to try to get at what what some of my, yeah. my trouble is as the microphone is on its way um i would uh add a short observation that I, I totally agree that the two guys don't work mm -hmm. i don't hate them so much as i find them boring mm -hmm. frankly and uh one of the things that i was doing as i was was watching or rewatching the film was to ask myself how treat williams who played the, the hairy guy mm -hmm. uh in in the film version mm -hmm. 10 years later yeah 10 in, years later in hair uh -huh. yeah. Uh, in hair, sorry. Yeah. yeah. And who, you know, whatever you say of him, carried the film. Oh, yeah, I uh, like him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. How he would would have done. And then the other thing that came back to me is that, well done, this is something that she also said when she uh, was here, um, said, I'm terrified of actors. Mm -hmm. And uh, the um, one of the things that you can tell from these two guys is that they're trained stage actors. You know they've gone through their shakespeare and they know what to do and and they clearly can't figure out what's going on 
to my mind, on that film set, and they can mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. productively work with the instruction, whereas with the instructions that she's giving them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's definitely not a conventional film shoot, and it's not a scripted role. Uh, so they're sort of at a loss. Mm-hmm. Plus, mm-hmm. they don't work on camera, mm-hmm. whereas Viva does. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and, and she seems to be more capable of of handling that situation and it's in a way in a way i mean it, i agree that the, the film has wonderful moments but it doesn't really hang together mm-hmm. and a lot of it has to do with the fact that she made that casting decision that the triangle was so important mm-hmm. but those two guys just can't carry the film may, may I just um, just before we go to questions just one little last point yes. um for me, part of another reason why, why I mean, I th- whatever I chose to show it, it's, I think it's an interesting mess, but, um, but what part of the reason why I'm, I'm maybe laying the blame at Varda and trying to give some context for, for this is um, like there are certain sequences the, um, that to me are just that don't work, um, that are really embarrassing and also rhythmically don't work. Like at the end, toward the end of the film, we have that stupid homage to Hollywood with um, that, that for me, sorry, um, um, that doesn't work. And then the earlier homage um, to, with the, um, to child stars, the Hollywood sequences. And that to me, the reason why I think they don't work aside from, I think sort of rhythmically in the film is um, I feel like that kind of indiscriminate um, love of Hollywood and Hollywood stars is um, against the um, sensibilities of the countercultural scenes that she's depicting. Mm-hmm. Um, that that's not that to me seems you could write that to me seems like a a, a kind of cute naive misunderstanding of the um, intense um, star worship um, in certain underground scenes. Um, Mm. The stuff with the beard, I think, is more successful, but I feel like those Hollywood sequences, so that to me just feels like it's just, that. that's where I start thinking, what is going on here? Whose perspective are we being presented with? Um, Because it didn't feel to me, and I'm, I'm by no means trying to take over and speak for the scenes, there's other perspectives, but it didn't feel to me like it was a perspective of them leading their normal everyday lives or something, as Varda sort of tries to put forth. Yeah, you already started to talk about some things that I'm uh, very much interested in, and um, I, I loved your talk, and um, I would like you to talk more, to talk less about the stars, perhaps for a moment, and um, say more exactly about um, the the place or the site where the inventory with the touristic, in a way, meets. Namely, I, I mean both uh, the shots of the city, and you started already to talk about it, and um, the television, and um, because at some point. So television has also a power that goes far beyond uh, the documentary in uh, in this film. So and I was I was wondering, so if this if one sees this film more as as a um, as a failed sociological uh, enterprise, it was also then the shots of Hollywood itself became become also interesting, because in the end I think these. Um, uh, so most of the shots of, of Hollywood are very touristy, mm-hmm. and um, but there are these little scenes, for instance, in in Larry Edmonds' bookshop, mm-hmm. um, which make it more interesting because then, um, which is also a touristy spot, but uh, something happens there beyond the star of Peter Bogdanovich leaving the shop. But there's a certain exploration there that takes place of the. Um, of the space, and I was wondering whether all these elements perhaps might go together, where the inventory meets the, the touristy, mm. and um, um, uh, also where, uh, where where television kicks in, and then all the stars, including Viva, have no chance anymore. Mm-hmm. Okay, but Mark wants to answer first. I'm sure. Um, I mean, it, I mean, I, I think those are super interesting um, observations. The I mean, the connection of the touristic and the in, inventorizing, and I think that's often a, a kind of 
what one does in a new culture is kind of take stock of of things um, and try to assimilate them into some sort of image of that that culture, perhaps, or better not <laughs> to assimilate them. Um, but maybe I'll just pick up. I think the the Larry Edmonds scene is a good example um, where. And that I think part of what makes that scene live um, is because of the the life of that store, and that we get we we get that um, um, with less um, without a kind of musical sequence. Without it's not it, it's sort of it, it's maybe the témoignage part. If there's something about the like there, and that, that's why I think to be completely fair to Varda. Um, I do think this is a transitional work. I think that we're seeing her starting to try to figure out how to bring documentary aspects into her work. And she's just trying a bunch of things out in this film. And when they work is for me in the Larry Edmonds. And also the, the one moment where we do get a, a countercultural scene in LA um, at the beginning of the film on the beach with this kind of protest with the police. Um, that's just a kind of moment that for me also seems to work. There's a kind of life to the images there. I just have a couple thoughts. Uh, maybe I'm missing um, if there's something more specific about television. I mean, I didn't talk about television at all. I was sort of, it's so present in the film. And yet I didn't, and even in one of the, the beautiful posters, but I didn't really have, I felt like I didn't have anything to say about it. Yeah, yeah, it's in the credits as one of the one of the stars, and I think I mean Varda. Varda, you know, the lies of the title for Varda is in reference to the media. That's what she says, and that for her the media is lies. And I felt that. I feel that there's a that television is being trashed in the film. That she's that there's there's a moment actually the. Even the, the Eddie Constantine, I'm dead. You're dead because you know Viva's dead. She's watching television, and then in the moment, um, uh, Shirley Clark is not supposed to watch television um, at the end of the film, and so Carlos um, shows her a film in a sense, a montage sequence of of the the stupid sequence of the history of Hollywood. Where then at least he goes into the Larry Emmons bookstore. So it seemed to me that somehow I, I would wonder. I felt. It, what is the relationship between television and film here that's being set up? And it seemed to me that television is somehow being, is kind of like dead time and deadening. No? I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. I don't know. But but for me, yeah. okay. honestly, I mean, for me, I don't, I, I'd like to hear someone else who has interesting things to say about television in the film. Because for me, it, I don't see anything interesting about it, <laughs> frankly, in the film. So I'm trying to, to build on something. I mean, I could tell more information about stuff, but that, that's just in terms of perspectives on it. I don't, I don't have much to say about it, obviously. Uh, well, thanks for the, for the film and, and for the introduction, too. Uh, I had a couple things to bring up. One was about the title itself and about the cats. Uh, and the other thing is about some of your comments about the, the ethics of the, or the film or of, or of Varda generally. Um, there, there were cats in there. They were big cats uh, for the most part. But I was wondering about um, the, the title of the, the film, Lion's Love, and, and where that came from. You mentioned the, the longer version and, and part of it that they discarded, but it wasn't clear to me. Um, what the title itself was a reference to, although there was one thing that I caught. It, came, it went by very quickly, but it was in that montage of of newspaper articles, and uh, some of them were about the big events of the day, but some of them were just about smaller, more mundane things that were going on, and one of them seemed to be about uh, a lion at the zoo that was having trouble uh, uh, conceiving or something like that. It was, it was, and so that that added a kind of ironic level to the title itself, Lion's Love, because it had that little snippet about a you know a, a lion who wasn't a who wasn't a successful lover mm -hmm. i don't know if 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 uh um i read that correctly or not but mm -hmm. so i, I want to know what the what you read the title to be about mm -hmm. and then I, secondly i just wanted to ask you about um maybe to elaborate a little bit on on some of your comments about uh the 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 ethics of the way that she uh shoots some of the the scenes and 
on the one hand inserts herself as a subject, but at the same time preserves the the difference, the, the subjectivity of some of the people that she's shooting. Because you you just said that there are dishonest elements of of this particular film that seem to stand in tension with what you were saying earlier about the mm -hmm. the honesty of how she shoots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for the comments. Um, maybe just the first the first thing about the title. Um, I think Varda was, yeah, the title, I think, is really just simply a list. Um, it doesn't entirely work now that it's just called Lion's Love because one thinks that there should be an apostrophe, that it should be a bunch of lions, the love of a bunch of lions. But I really think that for Varda, it was just meant to be a list. Lions, which for her, she says um, that it was an... 19th century term used sometimes for actors. Um, I think w for those of us who've been seeing her films, we know that she she tries to kind of bring the feline in <laughs> wherever she can, and I don't think it necessarily has so much meaning. Um, I think it's particularly just a taste of hers, but I think she s saw that these three, she sees like hippies, long hair, she refers to the mane, of the hippie's hair in relation to a lion. So I think that's another connection, actors and hippies, um, um, and, and her taste. And um, love, um, she coming out of the her, her being confronted with the be-ins, the love-ins, hippies, um, it led her to make a very radical choice for her, actually, if you've, if for those of us who've seen a bunch of her films, namely to focus on a trio. She usually focuses on like a heterosexual couple um, as her way of exploring a city and here she focuses on a trio as a way of not exploring the city maybe but anyway the trio and she as she sees them as a love trio um, I didn't see a lot of love there but that's that's I think what she sees and then yeah and then the lies I, I mentioned that she sees them as um, as the media and I think she wanted to position the lions and the love against the lies of the media um, uh, her, in her in her um, mind. I don't know entirely what the lies of the media are, but I think Varda seems to, that's another thing that irritates me, <laughs> sorry, um, um, with the film is I feel this whole, it's a Varda interest in <laughs> the truth and false and that stuff to me doesn't go very far in, in the film. I find that not particularly interesting. Um, or, or productive, but I think for her somehow that is. Um, yeah, the ethics. Um, I mean, I think I was trying, trying to understand um, self-reflexivity and trying to think through um, some of the the terms that have been used throughout the series and that Varda uses to describe her work. Self-portraits of others is something we've used that we haven't really discussed as a kind of ethical concept, but it felt to me that it was somewhat implicit that people seem to think that was sort of like a cool right on thing to do or something. And so I wanted to try to understand that. And subjective documentary to me was another one to try to understand um, um, what are the the um, ramification or the, the implications in for the relationship between the self and the other when one sub objectivizes images of the other when one actually um, um, claims and also um, stages the images of the other as part of one's subjective um, condition or fantasy or state like the pregnant woman um, and so then I was trying to then think, well, can this, if we accept that as a, as a discussion of the ethics in or some of the ethical questions involved in the self-reflexive gesture, um, um, uh, yeah, so then I wanted to try to think through what are the, what are the ethical implications of the self-reflexive gesture? When does referring to the self open up possibilities of um, connection with the other that are not about assimilating the other to the self. Like I am a gleaner, just like them, they, they're gleaners, I'm gleaners, I make, I glean images and they glean 
food from the street that they can't afford to buy because they want to or or um and i and so that's where i zeroed in on the issue of death there and then tried in this strange way to make a connection with the significance of death that to me hovers over this film and then to wonder well why doesn't to my mind death function in that same productive self-reflexive way in this film that it does in the earlier ones does that help Okay, it's just a, a, a quick uh, add-on um, in a matter of cats uh, <laughs> and felines, uh, just just to remind you of the fact that the the, the trademark animal of Cine Tamaris is a cat, uh, and Tamaris actually was her cat, and it's always been her trademark ever since she formed her own company, which relates to Leo the lion and MGM, of course. So, yeah, I, I would like. To get back to that uh, getting bored mm. um, because I think that Varda does wants to show something wants to demonstrate something wants to illustrate the spectator and educate the spectator also somehow and I feel that this um, it, it reminds me often of films that are produced for um, school classes to demonstrate physics or phenomenons of natural science, whatever. So this kind of films are those that I think of when I see Varda's films. And when the film starts, it's actually, it, it has, it, it is that. So um, the, everything is fake or most things are fake and it is said that it is fake. And then they are in this um, pool and they are mentioning um companies and figures and um but i don't know i i've missed the moment when it becomes boring when you see oh it's turning around itself the number three and three there and three on that side so it um yeah and some of you said the film has a few good moments or there are several good moments but these moments are like interweaved between these very long, boring scenes that seem to go to nowhere. And it ends with this uh, scene that actually goes to nowhere. I just want to breathe for a minute. Mm -hmm. And I find it very, like, consequent. So at the end, I said, oh, actually, the film wasn't that bad, because at the end, it is very consequent. The audience has to get bored at some point. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I thought again about... Um, what happens if you read a, a novel and it gets boring? And um, what if you read La Sama Lima describing some um, kitchen recepts, whatever? It gets boring, so mm -hmm. you have to get bored of it. So uh, it achieves <laughs> this mm -hmm. quite well. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just say I, I I'm not bored by the film. I, I find it tedious, um, and I find I, I really. Um, there, I, th I mean, you know, chacun son, son langeweile. <laughs> no, I mean, like, you know, each person has their own particular boredom that they, that they enjoy. I, I, I don't find Andy Warhol's films boring, um, in which they would be like the final shot, but for, um, eight hours, <laughs> no, in the case of Sampire, but more for, for, um, like 30, 30, 90 minutes, minutes or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and that, um, yeah, so, so I was just going to say that. And I, just if I can just say one thing about the, um, the, the sequence, the inventory of a rented house, where, um, where there's the drawing attention to um, kitsch. Um, to me, that, that also somehow, I don't know, maybe it's a weird argument I'm making. I'm really open to that, but it just rings false to me. It, it just, for me... Maybe I'm 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 just being bombed. I want my Viva <laughs> differently, but that to me seems like um, I I think in I, I I guess I subscribe to an I to what let's say an idea of kitsch that the literary scholar Eve Sedgwick described, where she says that kitsch is an attribution taking from Hermann Broch and the kitsch man, but that kitsch is an attribution where you um, actually and she opposes kitsch and camp and says camp is a recognition. Kitsch is where you look at an object and say, 
who could possibly like that? Um, therefore, I'm going to buy it. Um, because you know that no one would think that you really like it. So it's a kind of often a class um, uh, degrading other classes, whereas camp is a recognition where you say like, oh God, that object is so fantastic. Like who could have made it? Who could? Who else would like it? I have to have it. And there's a different sort of, of sociality formed through that. And for me, what, what happens in that sequence is a drawing attention to these objects in a way that is not taking those objects seriously enough as um, as valued things for the people there. It's 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 an outside view on on it's a kitsch attribution to someone who's interested genuinely, perhaps in that in that culture of collecting those particular things. It's not a particularly cool perspective for a gleaner. <laughs> I mean, later she became a gleaner, but so she's transitioning. Okay, we'll give her time. Kalani. Okay. I just want to go back to the idea, because we've said it so many times, and then um, Remember talked about it, but also it drew my attention to this organizing principle in the film when you talked about an inventory and taking stock, mm -hmm. and you kind of did that in your presentation. You said, okay, here's a few things. And so I was thinking even in the opening pre credits where you have this list and nothing's really hierarchical. Mm -hmm. um, you just kind of have this like ongoing, you know, non-punctuated list of things or people in the film. And I was thinking about the the promise of an inventory or the potential of it, but also the problem of it. So the problem of an inventory is, of course, that it's limited and it strives to be thorough or strives for totality. I'm going to look at something in this particular space and I'm going to take stock of it. Um, on the other hand, an inventory, um, if this is one of the organizing principles in some of these scenes, can be very productive because um, it is non-hierarchical and things gain meaning only in relationship to other things. And so something on list number 42 in the inventory can be very interesting because of what it's placed next to. And so I was thinking throughout the film of these instances where you have things like um, listing the ways that I like you or something in the pool or um, the scene with the milk where he's talking about um, like whatever America's I don't know, I forget what it is, America's war, America's this, America's that, and listing these kind of things or these lists or these inventories. And I wanted to know, is that is that something that could be a, a productive organizing principle in this film? Maybe also with respect to what you said before, like an inventory of the house. What, what do I see here and how do these things gain meaning? How is a plastic bird of paradise maybe more interesting because of what is placed next to? Or how are images um, on television of people talking about JFK within this particular street or something? So it's always like circumscribed. Um, but, you know, how then do you not have like an informant talking about JFK who's then like the, the one person talking about it, but everybody kind of has you know some something to say about it and things become or have meaning because of what they're juxtaposed with that, that's fantastic that's a, a i think a fantastic observation um and um yeah i didn't um i i, I do think that there's a tension between the um inventorizing tendency of the film and the chronicling and the collaging and the storytelling. Um, maybe that's an inventory also, that, that, um, but I'm not sure how. Yeah, because it's not, I was thinking also about what you said in your talk, like it's not really gleaning, right? Like mm -hmm. an inventory is not gleaning, it's something, something else. It's not right, just well, let me collect everything that I think I see here. Right, no, and I, I, I think, um, no, I think that's, that's fantastic. That, I think that approach, um, if, if there was, if if the tendency in the film was pushed more toward the inventorizing, I think it would have been a far more fascinating film for me, at least, because I think it would have been a more honest film, if you will, of like honest in the sense of not collecting everything to a totality and forcing meaning, but but the kind of to me the the inventorizing, um, like where it. Yeah, so I'm, I, I just, I think you're, I completely agree. I think that, and it would be interesting and productive maybe for me, for what I'm doing to think more about the structure of an inventory of what, um, and of what that can, 
yeah, what that can mean as a structuring principle. I would just say that that in Varda, I think one of the, I, I don't, I mean, she did that. I was taking that from her and also from the film. She, of course, has said lots of different things about this film. I feel like she knows, she obviously knows it didn't work. That's why she made it into one of her shacks of failure, which is a kind of incredibly wonderful, um, modest, vulnerable thing that she did. Um, but, um, you know, 40 years, 45 years after it was made. But she... Um, but I think one of the things that she's often interested in is, is, um, is this relationship between the real and the fake. And so that here, so much of the, the kind of things that one gleans, that later is the gleaner she gleans, like things from the street, the objects that we were talking about, um, she subjects them to the, the, the authentic true, um, the, the real false, dichotomy, which I think is a, is a, um, an unfortunate imposition on that arbitrary collection. As an example of what I mean is in the scene where Shirley Clark, it's, it's literalized in the scene where Shirley Clark is like, oh God, I can't make my film. What am I going to do? Oh, let me look. And then this kind of fantastic um, sequence of, of um, the real or like the, the fake bird of paradise, the real bird of paradise. And so I think that kind of back and forth is quite literalizing what actually for Varda's is, is something really interesting, um, but not for me. Yeah, yeah I, I just want to add that I think that's a, an enormously productive observation and even beyond that particular film. I was just thinking that in uh, Les Glaneurs et la Glaneuse, there's an inventory of the gleaners of the paintings, you know, there's this whole geography of, of the regional and provincial museums that have paintings of cleaners, and she, in, in, in the end, she collects uh, a pretty comprehensive inventory of paintings of cleaners, and and th so what I would take from that is that actually looking at Vardar's body of work, I think the category of inventor inventory and inventorizing is one that that really. It helps us understand some of the things that she's doing, and and you know taking this one step further, we could actually establish an inventory of things she does in her films besides mm -hmm. storytelling, mm -hmm. which is only a minor concern in most of her films, you know, and and documenting and timoniage would be would be another strategy, and and gleaning would be another strategy. Um, so, on that note. If there are no more questions, I think we can leave the room with a productive heuristics for further study of Thank Agnes you. Valda's oh. work. And thanks again, Mark, for a wonderful presentation and discussion.